they're the people we hope never to need. But when an emergency occurs, they're all we depend on. Ambulance um, emergency. Tell me exactly what's happened. I'm going to tell you how to stop the bleeding, OK? Filming with 999 call takers, emergency paramedics and their patients. This is the continuing story of the men and women of the HSE National Ambulance Service. That's the bits of this job I love. Great fun. Hey, 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 hey. It's OK. It's OK. This time, what happens when all is not as it appears and an unusual call becomes a frustrating chase? He had been drinking for a period of time and that didn't help. Now you're running up and down the yard. You cannot do that. Uh, we're requesting guard assistance. How ambulance crews cope when faced with a foreign language barrier. Well, there was certainly something not right with the gentleman. He has to go into hospital, yeah. yeah. And when day leads to night, how paramedics stand at greater risk. An awful lot of our nighttime calls are either alcohol or drug related. We're with the ambulance. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was just out for a fight and it didn't matter who was standing in front of him. Don't even think about it. So when we come in in the mornings, you know, the first thing is to check the vehicle out and make sure that we're ready to go and we're ready to deal with every single eventuality that you can imagine from a medical point of view during the day. You could have five minutes before you're gone or you have an hour before you get the first call. But once you go, very, very rarely do we get back to base. You know, we're just constantly, the city is so big these days, the population is so big that we're just going from one call to the next, to the next, to the next. You know, when we come into work in the mornings, there's nearly three guarantees. There's a good chance that we'd be assaulted at some stage during the day, be it verbally or physically. There is a very good chance that we'll have to tell somebody that their loved one has died during the course of the day of duty. And there is a very, very good chance that we will meet somebody today whose life will be changed forever due to whatever circumstances they find themselves in that they need an ambulance, because nobody ever rings an ambulance when they're having a good day. It's a right glare of the sky, isn't there? It is clear, yeah. yeah. Some people, like, you know, family members or friends, it's like, jeez, your partner's a girl. It's different, um, two females working together. Didn't happen a lot in the past because I suppose um, years ago it would have been your local ambulance driver would have been driving the ambulance and they would have collected a nurse out of the local hospital and it's the nurse that would have responded with the driver to the calls. Um, so even when I joined in 2001 there was there was only two females working here in Cork City but since then, thank God, there's a lot more females that are being taken on. We've had a few patients who've, you know, looked at us and went like, have you no know man to drive the ambulance? Like, but how are we going to get to the hospital, you know? So what she was saying, oh, she were driving planes and trains and everything these days. Sometimes people will work a lot better with you as an all-female crew. Um, you don't get as much aggro at times from people, um, especially, I suppose, with drunks and that. They see it as a challenge if they see men in front of them. Whereas usually they don't if it's a female crew. So it has its advantages. Plus you don't have to listen to the men talking about cars and motorbikes and everything else. We can talk about normal stuff. OK, come on, let's do it. The day shift and the night shift are polar opposites. You think that, you know, we do the same thing 24-7. But we find an awful lot of our nighttime calls are either alcohol or drug related. <laughs> it's like the McQueen. <laughs> I suppose working on night shifts is a lot different um, to working by day. You have a lot more restrictions on you. Um, you. You probably can't see things that are going on around you as much as during the day due to light restrictions and that at times. There's a sparkly dress, Denise. There's a sparkly oh, dress. That's, that's very, very sparkly. Too sparkly. <laughs> you know, obviously, you're going to get people who are sick by night, the same as they get sick by day. And absolutely, 
that's that's what we're here for. Also, we're here for the people who have the alcohol addictions and the drug addictions, and they fall down and hurt themselves as well. No problem whatsoever. But what really kind of gets under my skin is the call where somebody will ring an ambulance in good faith, you go out, and then they'll either refuse to talk to you, or they won't let you into the house, or they'll absolutely refuse to go to hospital. To be fair, a lot of the time it's just messers, or if they'll see in the ambulance, they'll throw themselves down and tell you they hurt themselves, but they're just the jokers and the messers, and you'll get over that. It's just when things can kick off, it can take a, a very fast downturn. Sit on the ground and won't get up. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you actually kidding me? What would they like us to That's do? the call. We had a call to one of the main streets in the city to a guy who was on the street and wouldn't get up. 26 Alpha 07 Green. New onset of image pity. He won't get up. He won't get up. He'll get up when I get there. I'm telling you that now. That was the call. He's sitting on the street and he won't get up. So that straight away says to us there's some kind of a behavioural problem. <laughs> Hello, hello there. Your friends rang an ambulance for you. What's the problem? When we arrived on scene, we found exactly what it was. Exactly what it said in the tin. A guy sitting on the ground wouldn't get up. Hello? This is the ambulance. Hello? Hello? We got out to talk to him. There was a few people around. Um, a lot of the clubs in the area would have closed and people were talking and um, just congregating. When I approached him, he didn't lift his head. You know, he didn't have any indication that he was interactive in any way, shape or form. Hello? Are you going to talk to me at all? This is the ambulance here. What's your name? Hello? What's your name? So I introduced myself, tried to get him to speak to me, told him who we were, the ambulance service are here. Are you okay? No reaction. You can't stay on the street like this. Where are your friends gone? They go away? It's around the city at night, if you're there when it's coming to closing time or when people are out in the streets congregated, um, you have to be a lot more aware. Um, your peripheral vision is working overtime because you don't know who's going to come behind you or come from your side. So even though you're attending to the patient or your partner is attending to the patient, the other person is usually kind of back a little bit and taking in what's going on around them. After a couple of minutes, he began communicating through nodding and shaking his head. That was it, non-verbal, completely non-verbal. No, I didn't know whether he is non-verbal anyway. He certainly could hear me because of the fact that he was now nodding and shaking his head to answer my questions, but adamantly refusing to get up to the point where, you know, literally could do nothing for him. Come on into the ambulance and have a chat to me in there instead, will you? Come on, do, come on up before the guards come and we'll get you into the ambulance. Will you stand up? No. Why not? We can't force him to, to come me? with us. So we requested the assistance of the guards because we can't leave him there. We don't know exactly what's going on with him. He's refusing to let us help him. And the last thing you want is something to happen to this gentleman if we leave him there. OK, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll wait here until the guards come, OK? If you want to talk to me, I'm just standing next to you. All right? Between the time we called them and the time that they arrived, there was a passerby who decided that we were harassing the guy on the ground. Hey, hey, hey. Come here. Will you stop? Will you stop? Calm down. Calm down. All of a sudden, it just blows up. Decided to get stuck in both myself, Imelda, and the TV crew. Hello, we're looking up. The come ambulance back. service. Yes, come back. We're with the ambulance service. Don't. Hey, 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 hey. Listen. Calm down. Calm down. Don't. Calm down. What's up here? Calm down. Hey, oh, what did I ever do? Calm Listen. down. Calm down. down. I said calm Don't down. Don't even think about it. No, he didn't know the gentleman. He didn't know what was going on. Didn't know the story. But he didn't want to know. He was just out for a fight, and it didn't matter who was standing in front of him. He was going to have his fight, and that was it. Now, I'm sure if it was during the day, and if he hadn't been under the influence of alcohol, that's the last thing in the world that he'd have done. But for some reason, he decided, this is now something that I need to be involved in. The Gardaí, at this stage, were making their way towards us. And when they arrived, he was the first person arrested because of the fact that he was preventing us from doing our job. There was a gentleman clearly in need of 
intervention, whether it be medical or law, he needed help. No, stand up straight now. Stand up straight. The gentleman ended up being arrested because he kicked off when the guards were there as well. Don't even think about it. Once now, it's going to slap tonight. Enough, by. So for his own safety, he needed to be to be taken somewhere. He wouldn't come to the hospital with us, so the guards took him. Nothing like a good night, Saturday night in Cork City. No. We cleared, you know, we were ready for another call. 4102, go ahead. If I were clear there at that call on Washington Street, that patient wouldn't get up off the ground as per information. Um, Guardy were called for him, as you know, and while we were waiting for the guards to come for him, there was another guy who got stuck in all of us and assaulted all of us. And he has also been arrested. He's gone off in the same paddy wagon. So we are clear. I'll give you some buttons there now. Copy that. Are you all safe and well? Over. Yeah, we're grand. Just a bit of adrenaline bumping, but we're not injured. Thanks very much. Roger that. Thank you. About 10 minutes later, we got a call to the guard station. I had said to the guards when they were leaving that if they were concerned about him in any way medically, by all means, call us back. So we went down to the guard station to him, found him in exactly the same position that we'd left him in, sitting on the corner with his legs crossed, his arms folded, his head down, non-communicative. Come on. Up the steps. Now, keep coming up here now to me. Up here. Go up another small bit. We got him out to the ambulance, onto the stretcher. Now, good man. Here's your pillow, here's your pillow. Oh, okay, I'll get the guards, I'm getting the guards back out because we can't go like this. He gave me a little bit of trouble in that he wouldn't sit on the stretcher in a way that was possible for me to safely transport him to the emergency department. You listen to me now, I know you're not going to answer me, but just listen, okay? You're in the ambulance. Do you understand that? OK. You're on the trolley, on the stretcher. Do you understand that? And we're parked outside the guard station. We cannot stay here. We have to go. For us to go, you cannot lie in that position. You have to turn onto your side properly or else onto your back. OK? So we needed to get the guards back out again to have a word with them to see if they could convince him to sit up on the stretcher properly, you know, and, and, and like basically say, you know, if you don't sit in the stretcher and go to the hospital, then you have to come back into the guard station. The choice is yours. So lie down and go to the hospital and get yourself checked out. Or you'll be going back into a cell. All right? We asked him to turn over to put on his seatbelts. We take him down to the hospital and he said he wanted to get sick. You want to oh, vomit? Yeah, that's fine. Gosh, you've good English. Oh. Vomit into this. So you can't understand everything that's been said and you can't speak to us, just choosing not to. After a few minutes, he started talking to us. He was a foreign national, um, perfect English, had been completely understanding of all that was happening all along, except for the fact that he said he didn't remember what had happened. The guards had to come and take you because you wouldn't come with us. You came to the guard station, OK? And at the guard station, the guards were concerned about you because you wouldn't speak and you wouldn't get up off the floor. So they called the ambulance back and now you're in an ambulance. You're on the bed. We were just about to take you to the hospital. Gave him an option to come to the emergency department to be seen by the doctors. No, 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 I want to go home. So it was explained to him that they didn't have an option to go home at this stage, that he was in the care of the medical professionals. And if he didn't want to stay in our care, then he'd be going back into the care of the guardie. Option one is you stay on the ambulance and come down to the hospital with us, down to the Mercy Hospital, where the doctors can have a chat with you, OK? And option two is you get out of the ambulance, but if you get out of the ambulance, you're going back into the guard station. Which choice do you want to make? He was given the option and I explained it to him a few times, you know, if you don't come with us, you're going to be arrested. And he still choose not to go with us. There you go. Gardy, you're going to take you again, so there you go. Up you get. So he left the ambulance and was duly arrested again. If they can understand what they're doing, then they have a right to make a wrong decision. I think, in my opinion, he made the wrong decision. Walk down the steps, right? Yeah, the guards have him. Or yep. The whole process took up, I believe, one hour and 23 minutes of our night shift. Too much alcohol. 
joys of it. I've wasted an hour, a whole hour there now between those two interactions with that one individual and at the end of it like it's nothing except drink. And there's nothing medically wrong with him. He doesn't need to be in a hospital, he doesn't need to be in an ambulance, he's just uncooperative. If he cooperated the first time, it'd have been done and dealt with in ten minutes instead. Here we are now an hour later. And still, you know nothing concrete out of it. The whole situation was resolved with a good outcome for him, apart from the the fact that he ended up in the cell. But for us it's just you know, one and a half hours with nothing to show for it, you know. If you have somebody who has no English or very, very poor English, they can be very, very hard to communicate with. Uh, getting them to comply with requests uh, can be very, very difficult. You're trying to show them what you want them to do and they're looking at you and they can't comprehend what you're trying to do. You draw on your uh, imagination to, to come up with solutions, um, be it drawing pictures. You become very uh, creative at sign language. It's like a really bad game of charades. That's what that's like. Getting consent from them can be quite difficult. If you want to put an IV line into their hand for whatever reason, they're, they're kind of pulling away from you, they don't understand. Um, sometimes, which we've done in the past, is maybe ring or get somebody, to get them, if they have somebody close by to them who has good English, get them to try and translate what we're doing. Or if they ring somebody on their phone who has good English, which often is the case, and then they can, we can relay it that way. But again, it adds challenges, it adds time. It can be difficult to get a comprehensive history of the patient. Uh, so the language barrier things is, um, can be quite difficult to deal with. And obviously with the, there are lots of tourists, lots of uh, visitors to this city and the area. So yeah, we do come across it quite a lot. Roger, go ahead. We got a call to the foyer or to the corridor of one of the city Hotels. We have two calls coming in on this. The dispatch code there is 31 Delta 01. This patient is collapsed, possible heart attack. Mm. The information that was coming through was that it was a suspected heart attack. Your patient there is a 50 uh, year old male who is breathing but is not conscious. He is breathing but is not conscious. We were told that it was a foreign gentleman who was visiting. And that's pretty much all information we got when we uh, were travelling to the, to the hotel. It's upstairs, is it? Yeah. One of the members of staff met us and I had explained that they'd got the defib and they'd got all the, their, their equipment. So I suppose the minute you hear that, you start thinking, OK, well, th do you know, this could be serious enough. So the man... Uh, links. Not links. Not links. So good. Oh, so where is this blood Either from? way. We were led up to the gentleman. He, even from a distance, the gentleman looked pretty, pretty unwell. He was looked pretty unstable. There was certainly something not right with the gentleman. You're OK, you're OK. You're OK, turn over, turn over. So, did anybody see how he ended up yes. on the floor? Yes, okay. backwards. Was he complaining, of, any, was he complaining of anything before that? It's OK, it's OK, it's OK. We saw that he was quite agitated. Uh, a number of people around him. Had he been unwell today? <laughs> Sit him up against the wall, then. Yeah. Never hope. Nothing. Yeah, Paul. OK. You're OK. You're OK. You're OK. You're OK. He was quite sino, so his, his face and his lips were quite blue. There was some, clearly some blood and froth around his mouth. There was also a small, uh, small enough laceration to, uh, to the right side of his head. I actually knew a few of the staff members from the past calls and so on had said that there was a time when he hadn't been breathing and they were, they were very concerned for him, quite rightly so. No. You are his wife? Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. Has, yeah. has he any medical conditions? Yeah. Yes. It yeah. quickly transpired that this gentleman yeah. was, was German, uh, no English at all. Thankfully, um, there were, his wife was with him and there was a tour guide who was translating it and helping. <laughs> He wants to get up. Could you, Gert, could you get a chair? Gert? As big as you can find or a, a, something to sit him on kind of thing. Trying to communicate with this gentleman, it was uh, uh, obviously difficult with a language barrier. He didn't speak any English. So ask him if he's finding it hard to breathe. Gerhard, what's this? 
Ja, ich bin da. Können Sie atmen? Können Sie atmen? Wir stehen alles nur durch. We tried as best we could with the help of his wife and the translator and still not quite sure whether he was comprehending what we were saying or requesting him to do. So it was quite a challenge, just that first communication around what happened, what was wrong with him. You know, has he said what was wrong with him? Does he, does he ever have seizures? Was was What's then? That's okay. It's okay. Yeah. The gentleman was very combative. Very combative. He was talking, and I asked, I think I, Brian or myself asked the question, what is he saying? We understood that he wasn't even making any sense with what he was saying. So this kind of changed our game plan somewhat. Can you come here? Thank you. If you can hold, help me here, I need his arms straight like this. Yeah. We had to work very quickly to try and get a, what we'd call a baseline set of observations. So a blood pressure, a heart rate, uh, a blood sugars, uh, anything that might give us an indication as to what's actually going on with this gentleman. Uh, he, uh, he fought us all the way. Hey, 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 hey. It's OK. It's OK. We would have liked to have been able to apply oxygen to him. He was fighting that all the way. It wouldn't allow us to assess him properly. We couldn't get any vital signs on him. He kept pulling off the blood pressure cuff. So it was very, very difficult. Can I have your hand? Can I have your hand? Ah, bitte. That is the right hand, so it will be better. No? Nein? I found a few German words in the depths of my secondary school brain. Uh, Mr Cooper, my German teacher, would be proud of me. Difficult to assess, but we knew that we weren't in any danger. He wasn't um, aggressive towards us. We certainly don't take it personally, and certainly, particularly this gentleman, I don't think he knew who, where he was or what was happening to him. Uh, I think that was quite clear. Can you oh, put this it's up it's here? Put the knee. Put it on the knee. Great, good, good. It took a, a few minutes to, I suppose, get, get control and get a grip of the situation, which we did with the help of the staff and the family and those around us, and the gentleman did calm down. And I think, in a way, that helped ease the wife's mind. She was, she was quite distressed by seeing her husband in the state he was in. Oh, he has to go into hospital, yes. yeah, yeah. We can't leave him like this. We don't know what's happening with him. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, so he looks he looks very sick yes, in does. his face. Very he looks bad. like he hasn't been breathing properly. No. Okay. With the help of the uh, translator, we tried to get it across to him that he he did need to be in hospital, needed to be assessed in hospital, um, and uh, find out why he was acting like this. Can you yeah. ask him how is he feeling now? It's better now. He feels it's better. better now. No. Good. Great. Good. So can you, can you now say to him? It's really important that we take him to the hospital yes. to find out what has happened. OK. OK, because he is not, he's still not very well. No, he no. still looks unwell, he does. doesn't he? We got what, what we thought we needed to do. The gentleman was pacified to a degree. Great. Oh, good. Keep coming. Oh, Rex. <laughs> OK, up this way. Rex. He started to cooperate with us. He uh, stood up and sat down onto the stretcher of Aris, so made made things a, a little easier. No, all right, you're hurt. Okay, so this sort round here. Okay. So we we brought him down to the ambulance for the system. Could you ask him if he can see me okay and hear me okay? Okay. The man would get a vision. Yes. Oh, good, yeah. And you can hear me? Can yeah. Sure. yeah. OK, good. good. He's certainly come round a lot, hasn't yeah. he? Definitely. And he was uh, beginning to respond even more so to us. <laughs> we got through the call as best we could, really. It was, it was a, a difficult call. Yeah. What is she? A lot of, he a lot of blood. OK. Until a full diagnosis is made, and by that I mean actually in the hospital after CT, X-ray, anything else that's done, all of us in the pre-hospital uh, setting are making 
assumptions based on what we can what we can see, what we find. So, for example, a 12 lead ECG, that, that gentleman, um, just because we we went down the route, let's say, of a, of a neuro episode, or some sort of issue with the brain, we could not ignore the fact that it could be a cardiac issue. So we have to take um, 12 lead ECGs, we have to get our blood sugars, we, you know, we have to try and rule things out as well as ruling things in. He was assessed in the emergency department in uh, in Limerick. It did come out that he'd fallen over, but it would appear the fall was possibly the cause of him having um, an intracranial bleed, which was so significant. He was, later on that day, he was sedated, intubated, and transported to the, the neuro department down in, in Cork. So it was a, he was a sick gentleman, he, he certainly was. So hopefully, uh, we did the best for him on the, on the call, but uh, it was a challenge, it was a challenge. The, the language barrier didn't help, I must say. Yeah. Strange calls can be interesting. The ones where I'll look at it and go, OK, then, what's this about? Unfortunately, people will ring ambulances for an unknown number of reasons. We get everything. Strangest of strange calls. I kind of forget most of them, to be honest with you, because there's so many weird calls. <laughs> a man had come back from a flight, and he had, um, he had a rash on his hands, and he said that his, his hands got very itchy, and he needed an ambulance to bring him to the hospital at 10 past 5 in the morning. We had one person who wanted fire, Coast Guard, ambulance, the works. So as soon as we heard that, I was like, oh, something really bad's after happening. And basically it was this little old lady in the middle of nowhere who rang in to find out why her electricity wasn't working. One particular time, we were heading 30 miles away for this location, and it was a, a gentleman in his 40s who had a pain in his big toe. We got a call when a previous base I used to work in um, where the gentleman had a like a humidifier and it stopped working. So he rang 999 to um, try and fix it. Man swallowed a toothpick three days previously and now he had tummy pain. There was one time a man phoned me where he couldn't get any reception on his TV and he wanted me to organise somebody to go out and fix his aerial and tune his TV for him. We had another call from a lady who didn't want an ambulance for herself. She was concerned for her dog because there was broken glass and her doggy had walked on the broken glass. There was a call given one time in the ambulance, it uh, came into the ambulance station and I wasn't actually on the call, but it came in as a maternity call, 14 year old Bert Eminent. So the crew arrived down at the house to find that it was a dog having pups. I've been sent to someone having a nightmare before. Everything from toothache, period pain. I recently had a call for a, a temper tantrum. We've had things stuck in orifices of the body that should never have been there in the first place. I've had one where a gentleman, uh, his condom split and he wanted an ambulance. We received a call one night, County Limerick, come back several years ago, for a woman rang it in to say there was a bullock in her field and he was now in the garden and she needed an ambulance. No, we can't tell people over the phone, no, you're not getting an ambulance. Obviously, that's not professional. And we do go out, assess the patient. But sometimes when you're there, you just think, oh my God, what, what are we doing here? No, you wouldn't get them every single week, but there you get enough of them that you remember them. And uh, they can be, initially, can be quite funny by the sound of it, but then, of course, it gets quite frustrating if, if the ambulance is needed somewhere else. So we got a call for a gentleman out on the road. And myself and my colleague got out and tried to assess and see what was happening. I just got an awful bang. Right. We came in to find a gentleman that has obviously had a few drinks, um, a bit upset at the time. What happened today, guys? He walked into you, was it? To be fair to the lads in the builders' merchants, 
they invited invited him in off the road for his own safety. They said he was kind of swaying around, walking around, and was quite possibly going to be hit by a member of the public in a car. So they brought him in to try and just keep an eye on him till we got there. What, what's upsetting you? What's upsetting you today? Mm -hmm. Your life, OK. Yeah. There didn't seem to be anything particularly wrong with him. He did appear to be intoxicated. He wasn't steady on his feet. The, speech, the speech was a little slurred, but he was quite erratic in his behaviour. He wouldn't sit still long enough for us to assess him. I'll tell no. you what we'll do. We'll go to the ambulance and we'll have a chat in the ambulance. You're a bit cold to the touch there. We'll yeah. bring you into the heat and we'll have an old chat, me and you. What do you think? There was a little bit of confusion there, and obviously he had been drinking for a period of time, and that didn't help. Come on, so yeah. up you get. Come You're on, all wet in your pants. Come on, up you get. Come I have on. your stuff here. Are you okay in your feet? Ah. Are you okay in the feet? Do you want to hold on to me? I just walked in. Do you want to put them in your pocket again? That's we'll your phone we'll and stuff. We'll try and hold on to it. Come, Come on for a second, we have a look at you. Good lad. He was quite upset and wound up and we couldn't exactly get to the bottom of what the problem was. He wouldn't sit still and speak to us. What I'm saying to you is we look after you today, right? You're on the street, you're cold, you're wet. Come into the back of the ambulance, me and you will have a chat. We'll get you looked after. You're not in any state of mind to be left alone. We'll get you the fag, come on. We'll, come on. Come here. It was a busy morning in a busy, um, I think it was a warehouse with a show, showroom attached to it. So there was members of the public coming and going. Uh, we were fearful that he might run out onto the road and cause himself an injury or cause an injury to somebody else. He was quite irate, running around the place and in a builder's merchants, it wasn't the safest of areas. Come on, we get you some help. Come on and sit down with me and we have a chat. Obviously they're trying to run a business and there was forklifts and other machinery and this gentleman not fully coherent, running around. Come over here to me a minute, come on. Fine, guys, I need tobacco. I know that, but just... Fine, fine, go watch, watch your walk. We'll fine get you a fag. Watch the puddle. You're already wet. You couldn't assess the man at all. He wouldn't comply with requests. Um, he ran from one side of the yard to the other, uh, ran down behind a van. I think he set up on a pallet at one stage. Uh, incomprehensible sounds and words that made no sense at all. Um, he wouldn't comply with requests to be assessed. Uh, he actually turned a little bit, he got a bit agitated and a little bit threatening in some ways at one stage, so he became a concern for himself and to others. So we got the guardian involved in it. Two Lima 3-2. Lima 3-2, go ahead. Uh, we're requesting guard assistance. To be fair, Keith was actually on the radio and trying to organise guards and stuff, and just for his safety, and I suppose for other people's safety in the yard as well, I decided I'd keep a bit of a closer eye on him than Keith and try and direct them away from the business premises. This gentleman is becoming quite unruly. He's now running towards the showroom. I'm fearful for him and he may cause damage to the premises. Could you ask the guardy to put a, an ASAP on it, please, over? Yeah, Roger, that's what he's doing the tenant there also. Um, I'll get on to him straight away. We got Jamie to run after him. Jamie is younger and fitter than me, so uh, it was better that Jamie did the running and I just stood back and watched what was happening. I haven't called, OK? I haven't called. This, this oh, is we were there for a good period of time trying to talk to this person. Listen to me very carefully now. I'm not in. No, uh, we've been very, very I'm fair not. with you. We're here to help you. These boys rang us in good faith because they thought you were hurt. Now, you're running up and down the yard. You're running out. You cannot do that. Eventually, with the help of a few of our colleagues from the guards, uh, he decided eventually that he would come and chat to us and get assessed in the ambulance. You hold that, now, a good man. This is your cigarette. Hold that for no, me. Keep that, no, keep I'll, I'll, I'll hold that for a second. Come here a second. This is the behaviour we're dealing with now. It became a call, a difficult call, for no particular reason. Would you mind taking a spin out behind him just in case yeah, he tries to jump up? Yeah. Just, would, would you mind? Because it's, it's, it's completely unpredictable for no reason. Just took off running, dropped the jacket and... That's no problem. Just in case we do have to stop on the road. Like he, he's not violent, no, he's just uncooperative with us and we're trying to help him and... He's just pulling against us a little bit. Most of the calls you go to, there's chest pain or it's a stroke or it's a diabetic or a car crash. This particular gentleman didn't fall into any category. There was a worry of his safety, there was a worry of his safety for other people. He was going to run into a display room that could have caused damage to it. So there was a lot of other stuff going on there. And those calls do challenge you. The drama is over. We look after you. You're we safe. Go to the hospital and get You're yourself safe, right? Because you, 
you're, you're not in the state of mind to be left on your own, friend. OK. You expect that type of call at night time, but alcohol, not at, in the morning time on a weekday. It does test the patients a little bit. People call for all sorts of reasons. There is literally from the sublime to the ridiculous and all in between. And we see, we see that on, on a, not on a, uh, a regular basis, sometimes on a daily basis. Can of paint fell, the patient got into the patient's eye and she slipped on paint then and injured her knee. Moderate by injury, she's completely that. Got a call one day to a, a local DIY store for apparently a lady that had fallen uh, in one of the aisles, a customer. I don't know where the van is. Hmm? Put up oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Grand here. We went to the aisle to find this lady sitting on the floor in a pool of pink paint. And the paint was covered her from head to toe. <laughs> yeah, all right, OK. Yeah, just, just hold your head back a little bit more, all right? Just a little bit more. This lady is lying on the ground uh, trying to get up, but basically, because the paint is on the ground as well, she's slipping and sliding all over the floor. The trolley was brought in, and um, we, we, tr we, we got her T-shirt and that off and basically wrapped her in blankets. You just hear a little bump there on the way into the ambulance, love. We managed to get the lady from the scene into the ambulance, uh, wrapped her in several blankets to try and uh, keep basically our equipment from being Peppa Pig pink paint all the way. That's like a tongue, tongue twister. I'm going to just flush out a wee bit more, all right? Yeah. But I, I think we got it all at this stage. She had got some of the paint in her eyes, so our next concern was to, to basically irrigate her eyes and uh, to try and make sure there was no uh, paint had, any, had done any lasting damage to her eyes. Oh. Your knee's very sore, is it? Yeah, go back. We'll have we look at that now, all right? Yeah. Now, your, he your face is going to get a bit wet, all right? Yeah. The staff themselves were trained in first aid and they had washed her eyes out to a certain extent. Now, put your head the other way, love. Yeah. Put your head over the other way. That's it. Just try and open your eye a little bit. It's only water, OK? It's only water. Open and close the eye. Good girl, you're doing well. No, that's it. OK. Lucky enough, it was a water-based paint, so I don't think it was any lasting damage. We managed to irrigate her eyes and uh, settle the woman down. I'm not happy to die for a while. Well, just if you can't wash it, if you wash it, it'll wash it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's it's water-based paint, so, yeah. saying, so it's not so bad. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's it's emulsion, so... Yeah, all right. We don't usually do hair washing in the ambulance, but there's always support for everything, isn't there? No, good woman, all right. All right. Yeah. Now we'll have a wee look at the knee, OK? Yeah. Oh. Now, dear. Uh, now, where is your knee actually sore? All right. Just here? Uh -huh. No, I didn't touch it. No, it all right. OK. Did you land on you on your knee? You did, OK. We walked through the call and tried as much as possible to uh, subdue the pink paint from getting all over the equipment and all over the stretcher and the ambulance and so on. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now, dear, we'll take you up the draw to get you sorted out from here, all right? She was a little bit, you know, embarrassed and so on and, uh, you know, annoyed. But um, I don't think there's any lasting damage in the end. But it would definitely go down to the book as the unusual calls category there. They're burning in at the back. It took a while to clean it all up. I'd say there's still remnants of it there in the ambulance. I think I still have pink paint in some of my uniform. For us responding out to calls now with so many different nationalities, and not only nationalities, but 
ethnic backgrounds, um, ethnic traditions, things like that. Um, it has made the job a little bit um, more interesting. You're met with a lot of challenges, the language barrier being the main one. With the language issues, you, you don't want to ask a question and for them to answer you and be basing on that answer, maybe giving a medicine, and it could be wrong. That's, that's our one huge concern. So we got called out to a GP surgery in Bandon. Bandon's a good distance away from us, so again, uh, as with any call, your, your first thoughts in the call are, OK, what's going on, obviously. And then you're thinking about, where are they, is the next thing. And kind of, so this chap was in a GP surgery, so you know there's going to be a bit of treatment before you get there. That's probably it there, with your man looking out. That's probably him. So we arrived down, found the address, I went in, and initially it was kind of funny afterwards, there was a chap standing at the door, and he was kind of a well-dressed chap, and I assumed he was the GP. We were kind of looking at him, asking the questions, and he was answering all the questions we were asking, to be fair. But uh, it turned out not to be the GP. The GP actually had just stepped out to write a letter for us. So, um, but fair juice, he could have been a GP. <laughs> Do you know, he was answering the questions so well. Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel, G-A-V-R-I-L-A. There was another man kind of standing next to him, uh, telling us the story, basically giving us a handover as to what happened. The reason he was explaining to us as to what happened was because the gentleman was a Romanian uh, national and he didn't have a single, not one word of English. He had been in work and he developed severe um, abdominal pain. So his friends brought him to the GP surgery to see was there something he could do. So the GP just wasn't uh, able to deal what was going on and wanted a few further tests on the hospital, so called ourselves. He's not on any medication. He had pneumonia about four years ago. He's not a smoker. Um, okay. That's right. And he seemed to be sore, physically sore, pulling yeah, himself up. All oh, right. Okay. A bit tender around, kind of. Okay. Sometimes people can't get across exactly what's going on or what's going wrong with themselves, especially if it's something kind of generalised that they're kind of not feeling well and you're like you have to ask specific questions. A lot of our questions initially are open-ended questions to find out what's going on. And then as we find out roughly what's going on, our questions narrow down to specific questions. And if you have a language barrier, it's hard to find out what's going on with the person. Acum e normal. Și că totodată se oprește. Eu nu mă las să să trag aer, că trebuie. He feels okay at the moment, but sometimes he he feels no no air. Just stop. Okay. We can use him as as our way of translating things back and forth to the gentleman. So I just have a quick press. Any any pain on your chest? If we press. A bit sore? A bit tender? Here, here, little. Here, a bit tender there. OK, when we press. OK. Because right. the translator didn't travel with us, we used our multilingual handbook. Sometimes you, you, you forget about the bits of kit that you have that you don't use every day of the week. But it just struck me, oh, great, I have this multilingual book in my bag. And it was one of the first times, actually, I'd used it. We'd only been issued with them recently. Which language? What it does is that there's the questions that we want to ask in English and on that person's language, the same number question. So number 17 is, are you in pain? So number 17 in that person's language is, are you in pain? So it, it gives the, the, we're able to ask the specific questions that we want to find out what's going on with the person so that we can provide the best care that we can for them. So. A little bit with the breathing. Yeah. OK. He was able to point to the answer, and we had a much better picture by using that book um, of what um, was wrong with the gentleman. It's good having these books now. Um, it gives us uh, an extra tool just to help people. It did pose a challenge, but it was just a little bit of patience. Um, the use of the book, and it turned out afterwards that you know it wasn't even cardiac chest pain that he was having. It was something totally different, 
and it was by using the book we were able to establish this.